السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So carry on with the pelvis lectures I'm gonna discuss in this presentation the anatomy of the muscles of the pelvis I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and the head of anatomy department at Mansoura University of Egypt In this presentation I'm gonna discuss the following objectives First, I will talk about the muscles of the lateral wall of the pelvis, including the obturator internus and piriformis muscles. And then I will talk about the muscles of the floor of the pelvis, including the levator ini and the coccygeus. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the pelvic fascia, both the parietal and the visceral layers. Let's first recall the organization of the pony pelvis. We have two hip bones, one on each side. They are separated at the back by the sacrum. And these bones are held together by ligaments. We have many ligaments, but uh, the most obvious one here is the sacrospinous ligament, which is triangular in shape, extends from the tip of the ischial spine to the lateral border of the lower part of the uh, sacrum and coccyx. And we have the sacrotuberous ligament, which lies more superficial to the sacrospinous ligament. It is attached to the medial border of the ischial tuberosity and extends to the uh, lateral edges of the sacrum and coccyx. Then we have the arrangement of the pelvic wall muscles. Here at the lateral wall of the pelvis, we have two muscles. The obturator internus, which covers the inner aspects of the obturator foramen and the piriformis muscle where we can see it exiting the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen then we have the floor of the pelvis or the pelvic diaphragm which is made by the big levator ini muscles one on each side cranial to it lies the coccygeus muscle so this is the general arrangement of the muscles of the pelvis we have what is called openings of the pelvis or foramina that lie uh, at the pelvis and communicate the pelvis with the thigh or with the perineum or the gluteal region. We have the obturator canal. It lies close to the uh, upper border of the obturator internus muscle and gives a passage for the obturator nerve and vessels. These structures will supply the medial aspect of the thigh. Then we have a big foramen, it's called the greater sciatic foramen. It is divided into two compartments above and below the piriformis muscle. So the structures that pass through it will be the piriformis muscle, some vessels and nerves. The vessels and nerves that lie superior to the piriformis will be the superior gluteal nerve and vessels while the vessels and nerves that lie below it will be the inferior gluteal nerve and vessels, the sciatic nerve, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and nerve to quadratus femoris, plus three structures that will pass from the greater sciatic foramen to the lesser sciatic foramen. I will talk about them in a minute. The other foramen that we have here is the lesser sciatic foramen. It gives a passage for the tendon of the obturator internus muscle plus some vessels and nerves. These are nerve to obturator internus, pudendal nerve and vessels. They pass from the greater sciatic foramen to the lesser sciatic foramen and from there to the perineum. For the muscles at the lateral wall of the pelvis, as I said, we have the obturator internus muscle. It is a flat, fan-shaped muscle that takes origin from the deep surface of the obturator membrane that seals the obturator foramen and also from the surrounding bones. Its muscle fibers converge to form a tendon that leaves the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen and then this tendon will make a 90 degree bend around the ischium, passes behind the hip joint to be inserted into 
the greater true contour of the femur. It takes its nerve supply from the sacral plexus through nerve to obturator internus and it acts as a lateral rotator of the femur when the hip joint is abducted. The other muscle that lies at the lateral pelvic wall is the piriformis muscle. It takes origin by three digits from the front of the sacral bone between the anterior sacral foramina. It is piriformis in shape or triangular in shape and then leaves the pelvis by passing laterally through the greater sciatic foramen. It then crosses the posterior superior aspect of the hip joint to be inserted into the greater trochanter of the femur just above the insertion of the obturator internus muscle. It is also supplied by branches from the sacral plexus and it has the same action as the obturator internus, which is abduction and lateral rotation of the hip joint. The floor of the pelvis or the pelvic diaphragm separates the two pelvic cavity from the perineum. It's formed of the following muscles, the levator ini and the coxygeus muscles. Of course, we have one on each side. The levator ini muscle has a skeletofacial origin. It takes origin from the side of the pelvic wall, from the posterior aspect of the body of the pubic bone, and then from the tendinous arch of the fascia over the obturator internus muscle, back to the ischial spine. And then the two muscles course medially and inferiorly to join at the midline. The levator ini muscle is formed of many parts, as we can see here in this uh, diagram. It's most anterior fibers that lie at the midline. Here we can call it in male the levator prostate or the sphincter vagina in female. The middle fibers. We have the puporectalis muscle, which takes origin from the back of the pubic bone and make a U-shaped sling around the inner rectal junction. We also have the pupocoxygeus muscle, which also takes origin from the pubic bone and inserts backward at the level of the coccyx. The posterior fibers, which is the most lateral ones, is called the iliocoxygeus muscle. This part of the muscle takes origin from the tendinous arch over the obturator fascia and inserts backward at the level of the coccyx. So the insertion of the elevator in eye is as follows. We enlarge this area here. We can see that the insertion of the elevator in eye is at the midline. So it starts anteriorly at the perineal body, which lies just anterior to the anal opening here. And then its fibers are attached around the anal canal and then at the anocoxygeal ligament and then at the tip of the coccyx. We can see the insertion of the levator in eye from the interior view. So this is the perineal body. This is, will be the puporectalis part around the anal canal. And this will be the pupocoxygeal part that will be inserted at the inocoxygeal ligament. And finally, the insertion will be here at the tip of the coccyx. The levator ini muscle will be supplied by the following nerves from direct branches of fourth sacral nerve, and this will supply the pelvic surface of the levator ini. Also, from the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves through the pudendal nerve, we call them the inferior rectal branches, and this will supply the perineal surface of the levator ini. The levator ini is related by its pelvic surface to the pelvic viscera, like uh, the rectum, the anal canal, the urinary bladder, the internal genital organs, while its perineal surface forms the inner walls of the 
to skeuroidal fossae. For the action of the levator in eye, because this muscle contains both type 1 and type 2 skeletal muscle fibers, so it helps in support the pelvic viscera in their position by continuous or tonic contraction. Also by its tonic contraction, it maintains the angle between the rectum and the anal canal. It relaxes only during defecation. Also it acts as a sphincter for the vagina and the rectum. And it has the ability to contract suddenly. So this helps uh, in continence of the urine and defecation during sudden contraction as in sneezing or coughing. Its contraction also assists in increasing the intra-abdominal pressure during defecation, micturition, and delivery. Uh, the last muscle I'm going to discuss is the coccygeus muscle. It is a small muscle that is triangular in shape, takes origin from the ischialis spine and the sacrospinous ligament, inserts at the lateral margin of the coccyx and sacrum. In elderly people, this muscle becomes uh, fibrosed and transforms into the sacrospinous ligament, so you cannot differentiate between it and the sacrospinous ligament. Its nerve supply from the anterior rami of the third and fourth sacral nerves, and its action is to support the pelvic viscera and also pulls the coccyx forward after defecation. Finally, we'll talk about the pelvic fascia. As I said before, we have two types of it, parietal layer and the visceral layer. The parietal fascia includes the obturator fascia that lines the pelvic wall. It is thickened in the middle to form a tendinous arch that gives attachment for the levator in eye muscle. Downward, it splits to enclose the pudendal canal. We have two types of the visceral fascia in the pelvis, the one that extends as a mesentery in the midline and surrounds the bases of the pelvic viscera and gives passage for the vessels and nerves to these organs, or the condensation of connective tissue that extends from this visceral fascia and surrounds the pelvic viscera and supports them by many ligaments. Also, some of the visceral fascia forms a sheath that surrounds the blood vessels and nerves. So basically, the visceral fascia again either surrounds the pieces of the pelvic viscera and act as a mesentery to transmit the vessels and nerves to them, or condense and forms ligaments that hold the viscera in place, or forms a sheath around the blood vessels and nerves. This would be the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share. And do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video. Please feel free to leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Thank you.